Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our time together this evening. Master, we love you, God, and we thank you, Lord, for this time that you allow us to come together to explore the Word of God, to delve into the deeper things of God. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost at every time, every, every single opportunity we have to, su to study the Word of God. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We need the writer, the author, the finisher of our faith to help us and lead us through the pages of your Word, Lord. Open our understanding. Open our minds today. Help us not only to hear, but to receive from your precious sacred text today, O God, the truths uh, which are necessary to our operating and walking in the Spirit. Master, um, bless this meeting tonight. Bless each and every individual who's participating by reason of the Internet, whether it be live or whether it later be by recording but we ask God that you would bless and help each and every individual, allow them to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. We ask it all today and none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. We've been talking now for the last couple of weeks on the topic of prophecy. You know, uh, I... Of course, I talked to Tommy quite a bit about a lot of different things. But, you know, I've told him, I said, um, if you believe the doctrine, if you believe the teaching of many different uh, denominations and organizations, then uh, probably two-thirds of the New Testament has absolutely no application to us whatsoever. Because according to the Southern Baptist Convention, when the Bible was printed, which is idiotic and stupid, uh, if, if I may say so, uh, they claim that that is the fulfillment of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And they claim what's perfect is the Word of God, the Scripture. So uh, I'm going to blow that theory out of the water and make a lot of people mad in the process. But those of you who know me know that making people mad is what I do. So, you know, it's not something I have a whole lot of trouble with. Um, but I will say this. Um, the written Word of God is not when that which is perfect has come. Uh, then that which is in part should be done away. We know because the Word of God then says, for now we see in part and we know in part, but then face to face, okay? We are not face to face with Jesus because we hold a Bible on our lap, okay? That's not how it works. No, when that which is perfect has come, when the Lord has returned and he has established his kingdom in the earth, then that which is perfect has come. There'll be no more need for prophecy. There'll be no more need for tongues. There'll be no more need for the gifts of the Spirit. Why would there be? Because no longer are we going to be flesh and blood beings communicating with God through spiritual means, but rather we're going to be spiritual beings communicating with God face to face. That was the whole point of what Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians. See what I mean about how uh, people love to pull things out of context. I mean, it, right there it says, now we see in part, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but then face to face. It's right there in context. And yet there are millions and millions of people in America today and around the world who embrace Baptist teaching, which is completely false and fraudulent because these people choose to uh, distort Scripture. They, they choose to distort the Word of God to make it say what they want it to say. See, Jehovah's Witnesses don't have a... The market on this, okay? There's a, there are a lot 
of different people who have been playing this game for hundreds of years, okay? Uh, and Mormons and so on and so forth, you know. Uh, this is a game that many who call themselves Christians play. And uh, you must be careful, folks. It, the Word of God said, <clears throat> Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, uh, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. If you are contorting and twisting and perverting Scripture to make it say what you want it to say, then you should be ashamed of yourself. Because in order to not be ashamed, what did Paul say? He said, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. How, how can we approach things so as not to be ashamed that we've done a shabby, careless job? rightly dividing the word of truth, okay? You don't pull stuff out of context. You don't use scriptures completely just drawn away from the next sentence and the sentence before it and the sentence after it in order to make it say, this is one of the techniques um, that the Jehovah's Witnesses have used for uh, since their beginning. Um, I remember years ago, you know, talking to some at my parents' house many, many years ago. And boy, I'm telling you, I was a kid, but I knew the Word of God. And the way they would pull something out, oh my goodness, the way they would pull something out of context and try to apply it and then pull it, Every cotton-picking sentence that came off their lips was pulling Scripture out of context. Every single, every single line they used. And they lead people down a path of deception and lies, one out-of-context Scripture after another, out-of-context after another, after another, after another. Well, I got news for you, my Baptist friend, my Southern Baptist friend, um, the Southern Baptist Convention plays the same identical game. And if you have any sincerity in your heart, if you have any desire in the world to know the truth of God's Word, then you need to ask the Lord to open your eyes and allow you to see if this old preacher isn't telling you the truth. Because if you're sincere and you ask the Lord, Lord, if what the preacher's saying is true, then help me to see it. I guarantee you, you're going to see it. Because God will, in fact, open your eyes. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find knock, and it shall be opened unto you. If you have a sincere heart, God will open it for you. Now, we have been talking about prophecy. And I say that a lot of denominations and a lot of movements that call themselves Christian um, basically nullify a, the big portion of the New Testament because they claim that so much that was experienced in the New Testament church is past. It no longer is experienced in the church today. We, you know, we don't experience the baptism of the Holy Ghost like that. We don't speak in tongues. We don't experience divine healing. You know, any miracle is a lying miracle. Uh, that's, a, that's another famous Baptist pull out of context, you know. Uh, they always love to point to the scripture that talks about uh, in the last days there'd be lying signs and wonders, you know. And uh, they, they love to suggest that any miracle today is a lying sign of one. Oh, that's to lead you off in a wrong direction. Um, wrong. Wrong. The lying signs and wonders the Word of God talks about ultimately are going to cause people to follow after the Antichrist. The lying signs and wonders are... Uh, miraculous or supernatural things that he'll be able to do and his false prophet will be able to do in order to convince people of 
his supremacy and his power. He will not do anything at all and give the glory to God. He will not do anything at all and give the glory to the name of Jesus Christ. Miracles and wonders that occur in the, in the, the world today through the name of Jesus Christ are absolutely legitimate because they are bringing glory to God. They are bringing glory to the name of Jesus Christ. It's not about bringing glory to the preacher or bringing glory to the individual. No, these things are done to the glory of God, okay? So uh, the notion that, you know, every miracle and every, you know, thing that is supernatural, that is credited to God, oh, that's a lying sign of wonder. Again, perfect example of false teaching and false doctrine and how they pull stuff out of context and they play this little game. They pervert every cotton-picking thing that comes off their lips. And I'm going to tell you, this, this preacher, folks, I don't know if it's the prophetic in me or what, but I get riled up when I see people distorting and perverting the Word of God. That troubles me. That You want to get me aggravated. Let me see that kind of foolishness going on. I don't have time for that garbage. Now, understanding the Word of God in its entirety is fully and completely applicable to the church today. Every bit as much as it was applicable to the first century church. The church that began in the book of Acts is the church Jesus is coming for. Okay, He is not coming for a church that looks different, that acts different, that believes different, that teaches different. No, 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 no. The church was started in the book of Acts, and it will continue until the Lord's return. And when that which is perfect is come, then yes, that which is in part shall be done away. But until then, the gifts of the Spirit are still very much in operation. That includes the Holy Ghost baptism with the initial evidence of speaking with other tongues. That includes divine healing. That includes deliverance from demons. All of these things are very much real and, and a very present reality in the church today. Having said that, there is something else that is very much real and present in the church today. And that is the gift of the Spirit that we've been talking about now for the past several weeks. Prophecy. God speaking to the church through individuals, inspiring them to speak on his behalf, thus saith the Lord. Inspiring them to declare, thus saith the Lord. And uh, we need this. Why in the world would they need it throughout the entire Old Testament? Israel needed prophets throughout the entire Old Testament. Uh, there were prophets present. Uh, Jesus said John the Baptist was the greatest prophet to ever live, which is really interesting because according to Hebrew teaching, uh, Moses was the greatest prophet, you see. And so here Jesus comes and says, oh no, Moses was big, but John the Baptist is bigger. Wow. Okay, that, that's a, that is a powerful endorsement of John's ministry, okay? Um, but we have prophets in, the New, in the, um, the New Testament era. You know, you had prophets. Uh, John is one, of course. And the Word of God actually talks about, in Scripture, talks about other prophets that existed in biblical times. But what I want to talk about now, I want to talk about examples of New Testament prophets, uh, meaning people who either prophesied or people who operated within the office of a prophet uh, in the context of the New Testament church. You have to remember when you study the Word of God, you have to remember 
the time of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is a bridge. It is connecting the Old Testament with the New Testament. It, it is the four apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, sharing their accounts of the life and times and ministry, words, teachings, actions of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in doing so, they help us to understand, uh, I want to use the word mechanics, they, how, they're helping us to understand the mechanics of the work of salvation. How did God go about bringing salvation to lost humanity? Well, he caused a virgin to conceive a child and to give birth to a child who, according to angelic uh, testimony, would be called, would be called, would be called the Son of God. And you always notice whenever the angels appeared to um, Mary and to uh, Joseph and what have you, the, the phraseology is always, he shall be called the son of the highest. He shall be called the son. They, they never say he is the son of God. No, no. He is the son of God after the flesh. But the whole idea is, that he did not exist in heaven as the Son of God. No, he existed in heaven as God. But on the earth, this man shall be called the Son of God. Why? Because he has no earthly father. He has no flesh and blood father. The only father he knows is literally the Spirit of Almighty God. So the phraseology is he shall be called the Son of God. Um, so he was born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a sinless life. Uh, he was crucified and died on the cross of Calvary. He was buried. He arose after three days. He appeared to, uh, according to the Apostle Paul, to over 500 people at one time. Uh, so there were many, many, many witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not just the apostles, not just the remaining 11 disciples after Judas had committed uh, commit um, suicide. I was about to say adultery. <laughs> after Judas commit suicide, the 11 uh, apostles were not the only witnesses to the Lord's resurrection. The Word of God tells us that uh, at one point there were over 500 people who saw and recognized and witnessed the resurrected Christ after uh, he had risen from the dead. And then, of course, he ascended. So uh, the Gospels are there to bridge the Old Testament and the New Testament. One of the biggest problems that many movements uh, within the Christian world make they try to create certain doctrine based upon uh, things they read in the Gospels. The only problem is you cannot create, uh, you, can, you cannot, for instance, you cannot go to the four Gospels and define the plan of salvation. No, how in the world could you? How could you? Before any human being could ever be saved, Jesus Christ had to die, listen carefully, and rise again. The resurrection was essential to salvation. The Apostle Paul tells us that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. So salvation is contingent not merely on believing that Jesus Christ um, died on the cross of Calvary for our sin. If you call yourself a Christian, a believer, and you believe that Jesus Christ lived 
and that he died on the cross of Calvary, but you just somehow or another cannot convince yourself that he rose from the dead. That seems like fiction to you. My friend, I'm here to tell you, you're lost. You are lost. In order to be saved, you must be able to not only confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, but you also must be able to believe from the heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Uh, for this reason, uh, going to the Gospels, and for instance, reading John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life, and saying, this is the plan of salvation. All you have to do to be saved is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. No, no. The, that the entirety of the four Gospels are written to help demonstrate and reveal to us the mechanics of salvation. Uh, there are many powerful, wonderful, important truths that are revealed to us. For instance, when Jesus had his conversation with Nicodemus in the garden uh, late at night, and Nicodemus said, you know, what must I do? And the Lord said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And he said, well, how can I be born again? You know, can I go back into my mother's womb and be, be, be born again? And the Lord said, no, no. He said, you've got to understand uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. I'm talking about a spiritual rebirth. And then he, he also said, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Some people try again, rather than rightly dividing the word of God, they try to suggest that when he says, except a man be born of water, he's referring to natural birth. Well, how on earth is anybody going to not be born of water? <laughs> he said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He can enter into the kingdom of God. No, the Lord was actually giving us a, uh, a glimpse into the New Testament plan of salvation, which would be articulated by Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.38, uh, when he preached, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There you have, uh, as Paul talks about in Hebrews 6, he talks about the two baptisms. He says, uh, leaving behind the, um, the uh, foundation of our faith, you know, when he goes down a list, he says in the uh, doctrine of baptisms, the New Testament Church of Jesus Christ does not have a doctrine of baptism. The Episcopal Church does. The Baptist Church does. Presbyterian Church does. But the New Testament Church of Jesus Christ does not. The New Testament Church of Jesus Christ has the doctrine of baptisms, plural. Water baptism, spirit baptism. Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. He was literally giving us kind of a glimpse into what Peter would later preach, okay? And rightly dividing the Word of God, you're able to go back now and see what the Lord said in John and look at what Peter preached at Pentecost. Says, ah, okay, I see the correlation here, okay? And when a baby is born, a baby is first drawn from the mother after what? The water breaks, okay? When you're baptized in water, you literally are physically uh, acting out a new birth, okay? We always talk about the concept of being buried with him in baptism and raised in newness of life. It's death and resurrection, but in resurrection we have new birth. 
So when you are baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ, you experience a new birth. You're brought forth from the water. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. When you come out of that water, that's part A. Part B is receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. When a baby's born, it's brought forth from the water. It's brought forth from what was the water sack in its mother's womb, okay? And, of course, the water breaks and the baby comes forth from that. Um, the second part, however, is once the baby has emerged from the mother, it has to do something it has never before done. It has to breathe on its own, okay? No longer is relying upon mommy to do the breathing for it and to provide it with oxygen through the umbilical cord and all that. Now he has or she has to be able to breathe on her own. And they take in that first breath of air. And usually, you know, years ago, the practice was they would take the baby and give it a little swat on the rear end. Not to be painful, not to be hurtful, but just enough to kind of shock its system a little bit. And then the baby would cry. And uh, when you heard that sound, you knew that the, the child was well, that they could breathe, and that they were, uh, you experienced a live birth, okay? And the same thing is true of the Holy Ghost baptism. That is God doing for us what he did for Adam in the Garden of Eden. The Word of God said that God first formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. But Adam literally lay there, fully formed, but lifeless. And the Word of God said, then God breathed into Adam, and Adam became a living soul. When we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, that is God breathing into the new birth, the new baby, the breath of life, so that you now can breathe. And how do we know you're breathing? How do we know you're well? How do we know you've experienced a life birth? You begin to cry out. The Word of God said that um, uh, the Holy Ghost is the spirit of adoption, and we've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And so when we begin to speak with other tongues, as our spirit begins to express itself, having been able by the Spirit of God to do so, we know, aha, that spiritual man is alive and well. All is well. Okay, we have a live birth on our hands. And that's why in a Pentecostal church, when people receive the Holy Ghost, uh, you'll see folks in the church getting happy and rejoicing because that's a great thing. And that's why when we baptize somebody in the name of the Lord, that is a great thing and a wonderful thing. And uh, I want to share a little bit of news with you as well tonight. Uh, Stephanie, one of our longtime extended members in California, uh, contacted me. She's been in contact with me this week via text. And uh, our extended members, I've told you before, uh, they are welcome to be in communication. If you have any questions, if you have any, anything you need, um, you can either text me or you can call or you can email or, or whatever you need to do to get a hold of me. And uh, she's been texting me this week. And one thing that she told me that has me very excited, uh, a friend of hers uh, has really been struggling and needing um, to get right with the Lord and what have you. And Stephanie has been able to uh, testify to this person and witness this person. And they are, I believe, Sunday. Um, they are going to be visiting an apostolic church. And Stephanie, I believe she and her husband visit this church and or go there, uh, which I fully support, by the way. Um, you know, I'm not against it as long as you can, you know, weed out stuff in, in teaching that's inaccurate or accurate or, you know, on the money or a little bit off, as long as you have some sense of discernment in some sense. But anyway, uh, she's bringing this person there to be baptized. They're going to be baptizing him in the name of the Lord. And that excites me because, again, 
<clears throat> that that is not something we've done directly, but we've done it indirectly. Um, Stephanie came to Dallas, oh, it's been a few years back, and I had the distinct honor of baptizing her in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And so now she's bringing a friend to be baptized, and that excites me. So we rejoice in that news today as well. All right. So now, and, and believe it or not, I know some of y'all are thinking, boy, this preacher goes off topic. No, I'm not. There, there's a reason. Some of the conversation I've been having with Stephanie and stuff has been around the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So there's kind of a reason I'm covering that a little bit tonight, because this is something that some people need to hear and they need to understand. All right. So. The New Testament church is today the same as what we read about in the book of Acts. The only book of the Bible that we have that is a historical record of the actions, the teachings, the sermons, the conduct of the New Testament church after the, the uh, gift of the Holy Ghost had been poured out is the book of Acts. Therefore, the book of Acts is probably the most important book in the Bible to New Testament believers because it is a blueprint. It shows us what the church is supposed to look like. It shows us how the church is supposed to act and how the church is supposed to behave. And then the epistles are an articulation by the apostles of specific doctrines and specific, uh, specific understandings on given issues and instruction in certain areas, okay? So, uh, prophecy was very much a big part of the New Testament church that we read about in the book of Acts. And, uh, you know, we've got folks trying to tell us, well, that was then and this is now. You know, we don't have prophecy in the church anymore. Well, I'm sorry, but I disagree with you. Until that which is perfect has come, we most certainly do have prophecy. In Acts chapter 11, verses 27 through 30, the word of the Lord tells us, And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth or famine throughout the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So some prophets came. These are individuals now who operate within prophetic ministry. This is not somebody who simply is moved upon to prophesy. No. The Word of God says in those days came prophets. So these people operated in the prophetic on a regular basis. They were operating uh, in the prophetic as an office versus as uh, just an occasional, you know, uh, gift. Uh, and they told the, they told the church at Antioch that there was going to be famine coming and you know and a lot of the saints in Judea were very poor and they were struggling there was a lot of, of um, persecution against the church those days so they decided at that point in time because the Lord warned them this was coming this okay well let's start setting aside let's start taking offerings let's start doing what we can so we can make sure the saints in Judea or in the land of Israel, don't wind up suffering when this happens. And of course it did happen. And the writer tells us, Luke the writer of Acts tells us, that this did indeed happen in the days of Claudius Caesar. 
So, there have been times that I have warned our church, like here uh, when we were in Dallas, I told our church before the um, financial mess that happened in 2008, I told our church, I said, folks, we've got a major economic calamity coming. You need to be very careful uh, about financial choices that you make. You need to be very careful about if you're buying a house, if you're buying a car, you know, anything. Excuse me, I said, you know, you need to be very careful. Uh, if possible, it wouldn't even hurt you to buy supplies uh, in advance that uh, you're going to need, like, for instance, uh, shampoo and soap and uh, dishwasher liquid, things like this. And I said, the reason for this is you'll be able to buy them cheaper now. So if you go ahead and buy up a lot of this stuff and have it, because um, you really don't have to have a, a, a whole lot of, of like soap and um shampoo and stuff like this in order to have a year or two supply you know Tommy and I I'm one of those kind of people I'm constantly buying in advance if if I see something on sale uh, that we use regularly be it toothpaste be it body wash be it um, uh, shampoo whatever I'll go ahead and buy a couple extra bottles, you know, and we literally, we are constantly probably two years ahead of ourselves. So if it should happen that we started experiencing, you know, financial crunch and things got tight for us, we wouldn't have to worry about buying those things for at least two years, literally, because I have enough in advance. So this is what I was advising the church. And I told people, I said, if you're thinking about buying a home, uh, you need to be very wise and you need to buy well within your means. Do not buy something that uh, is at the top of your budget, so to speak. You know, um, Tommy and I, have I've, we've always followed that, um, that uh, plan. That's, that's, something that I've kind of insisted upon. Uh, we could get approved for a certain amount of uh, pre-approval for a mortgage, and yet every house we've ever bought was like well beneath, way beneath what we were pre-approved for. I'm not going to go into hock. I'm not going to commit myself to, you know, high payments just because I can. You know what I'm saying? But a lot of people do. They get pre-approved for 400000 bless God. They go out shopping for a $400,000 house, you know. And then when the payment turns out to be $3,500 a month, they're struggling to make that payment, you know. Well, I was trying to tell the church, and this, this goes back, folks, to 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006. Everything fell apart, as you recall, in 2008 when the housing bubble popped. And I was warning people that this was coming, and I was trying to give them um, wise counsel as to how to best be prepared for this sort of thing. You know, do everything in your power now to keep your expenses as low as possible and to avoid any major purchases if you don't have to have it uh, avoid a major purchase until we I said this is not going to be a permanent situation but it is going to last a while and so uh, you know and I was giving at one night we'll be trying to give people counsel and advice all right so basically the Lord used me the same identical way he used these prophets in Antioch, okay, to warn the church of a certain situation that was coming and to help them know how to prepare for that situation, okay? Now, in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6, it says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, 
came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost that we hadn't even heard about the Holy Ghost. We don't know what you're talking about. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. It, just a quick point here. These people had already been baptized, but they had not been baptized according to the New Testament plan of salvation. And therefore, it was necessary that they be rebaptized. So I don't care if you were baptized as a baby. I don't care if your mother held you under the water for 10 minutes to make sure you come up holy. If you've not been baptized according to the New Testament plan of salvation, you need to be rebaptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spake with tongues, listen, and prophesied. So here we're not seeing people who are operating in uh, the office of prophet, like we did the prophets that came up to Antioch. Now we're seeing people who are simply operating under the anointing of the Holy Ghost so that they prophesied. Okay, see what I mean? I've talked about the two different aspects of prophecy. You have prophecy uh, as a temporal manifestation, and you have prophecy as an office. Not everybody who prophesies as a temporal manifestation suddenly becomes a prophet simply because they've prophesied. You see what I'm saying? All right. Any more than everybody who's ever gone to a racetrack and driven a race car. You know, if you got enough money, you can go to racetrack sometime and drive a professional race car around the track. That doesn't make you a race car driver just because you drove a race car. Am I telling the truth? I am. Well, the same thing is true. Just because you may have prophesied at some point in your life under the anointing of the Holy Ghost doesn't make you a prophet. But then there are those who, in fact, operate with a prophetic ministry. All right, so there you see the difference between the two, those who temporally prophesy and those who operate within uh, the office of a prophet. In Acts chapter 2, uh, 12 through 18, the Word of God said, and they were all amazed. This is after the... Holy Ghost fell on the day of Pentecost, and the Jews at Jer Jerusalem, who had come together for celebration of Pentecost, uh, it says, And they were all amazed, and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? This is, again, this is all the visitors in Jerusalem. When the Holy Ghost was, out, was poured out upon the 120 or so in the upper room, and uh, they spilled out into the streets. They were speaking with other tongues. Uh, they were magnifying God. They were blessing the Lord. They were worshiping God. They were preaching in various languages. And because people had come from all over the world, Jews had come from all over the world on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, um, there were people there from many different places. They were Jewish, but they spoke many different languages because they had uh, dispersed and gone all over the planet and been in different parts of the world. And then all of a sudden they're hearing uh, these that are coming out of the upper room preaching in, in a language they understand, in their own language. And so it says... Uh, they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaning this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. 
So some people are seeing what the apostles are doing, and they're saying, oh, these guys are drunk. Well, got news for you, honey. If all they were doing was speaking in tongues, why in the world would you think they were drunk? If I, if, if I went, you know, to New, I lived in New York City for t almost about 10 years. If I went uh, to Times Square and there were a bunch of people standing around Times Square preaching in a variety of different languages, I'm not, my first thought is not going to be, boy, look at these drunks. These guys are bombed out of their mind. No, there had to be something about their conduct. There had to be something about their actions and the way they were behaving that made the observer think that potentially they were drunk. And this is one of the side effects of an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Uh, there are times when the Spirit of the Lord is poured out and it literally is overwhelming to the human body. It's literally overwhelming to uh, we mere mortals, as it were. And it can literally have an effect on us. Um, it, I mean, it makes people stagger. Sometimes people dance and shout and get happy, you know. People run when they have nothing to run from or nothing to run to, you know. And, uh, and observers might think, boy, these people are bombed. Look at the way they're acting. That makes sense. So based on what we've seen in even more recent uh, times in the last century or so, with the outpouring of the Holy Ghost that began in 1900, uh, we can understand, oh, okay, I can understand why they might think that these people were drunk. So now Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. So Peter saying, first of all, it's too bloody early in the day for anybody to be drunk, number one. He said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So if the Southern Baptist Convention is right, then apparently this, this words of Joel are garbage, and we need to throw them out the window. Because after all, prophecy doesn't work. We don't experience prophecy anymore in the church. But according to Peter, this was the prophecy Joel had given concerning the last days. And what a lot of people don't understand is, a lot of times in Scripture we read of the term the last days. And we read that as if it suggests always um, the time frame immediately prior to the Lord's, uh, the uh, rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. There are times when that uh, understanding is applicable. However, what many people don't realize is that the birth of the church was the beginning of the last days. See, you don't start counting something down until you first get to the point, like when you're going to launch a rocket. You don't hear anybody in the background counting down, counting down, counting down, counting down for months and weeks and years to the countdown, no. But when they get to 10 minutes or whatever it is before the rocket is supposed to take off, that is officially when you begin the countdown. Do you follow what I'm saying? Well, prior to Messiah, how could they count down the end? You can't count down the end because the Messiah is the key figure to the end. So therefore, once Messiah came upon the scene, once salvation was purchased and provided for the church, now 
this whole thing starts counting down. Now, with the appearance of Jesus, we immediately start counting down to the end of time. Okay? So the last days literally applies to the entire church age. But at the same time, it can refer to um, the uh, time frame immediately prior to the Lord's coming in the rapture and the second coming of Jesus Christ. So anyway, so Peter said, in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So, according to the Lord, prophecy is a big part of the last days. Whether you count the last days as being from the time of the Lord until the end, or whether you count the last days as being the time period immediately to the second coming in the rapture. Regardless of how you look at it, prophecy is going to be a big part during those time frames. So therefore, we're talking in the here and now. Okay? All right. In Acts chapter 21, verses 7 through 14 and when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to uh, Ptolemus and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Notice, he doesn't call them prophets. He said they prophesied. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea, now listen to this, a certain prophet, named Agabus. So you see in the same passage again, you're seeing the two different manifestations of prophecy. You're seeing individuals who the Lord temporally allowed to come under a prophetic anointing and they prophesied. And then you have an individual named Agabus, the same person we read about earlier. Um, who had gone to uh, Antioch, and uh, we read about Agabus, who is named as a prophet. So he therefore had a prophetic ministry. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him, meaning Paul, not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, the, the will of the Lord be done. Okay, so in this passage again, you have those who prophesy and you have one who is named as a prophet. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 12 through 20. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, 
warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Boy, can I preach a sermon on that. You don't see the church preaching that today, do you? Verse 16, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying. So here we see Paul say, when the Lord moves on somebody to prophesy, don't, don't, don't take a bad attitude toward whatever God may have to say. Because there are times, I'm telling you, when I was a kid, growing up in the church in New England, the Spirit of the Lord would get on me, and I didn't even realize at the time that I was prophesying. Um, but the Spirit of the Lord would get on me, and I'd be prophesying. And do you know how many people in the church would just look at me, and, and they would resent what I was saying, rather than receive it and accept it and say, you know, the Lord's... My uncle, by marriage, told my mother one time, he said, you do realize that when Chuck gets up and starts testifying in church and all of a sudden he gets to preaching and, you know, he said, you do realize that he's prophesying, don't you? And uh, my uncle recognized that I was prophesying. And, uh, but there are people who will have the gall to resent and they don't appreciate when the Lord speaks through the prophetic, whether it be through an individual who, who occupies a prophetic office or whether it be simply the Lord moves upon somebody to prophesy in the temporal sense. They resent that. They don't appreciate that. And... Uh, you're in a dangerous place again, again. This again is where I have to go back to what I've said before about it is so important that we be able to recognize when the gifts are in operation. Folks, you need to be able to recognize if the Lord speaks a prophetic, well, I'll never forget as long as I live. I was in a prayer meeting in a Jesus name church that I was part of in East Texas years ago. Matter of fact, it's the church I was in when I finally made the full transition into the apostolic movement. And uh, we were in a prayer meeting. We were just having a prayer meeting. People were all over the church praying individually, you know. And uh, all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord came upon me, and I began to prophesy. And I began to say, Thus saith the Lord, uh, um, Strengthen your buttresses, and make steady your walls, because the enemy is about to come against you in a manner that you have never before experienced. You are about to experience an onslaught uh, from the enemy that will destroy you if you do not right now uh, choose to strengthen your defenses and you know and I begin to prophesy like this you know and uh, it wound up being that prophecy came maybe a year or so before I went through the experience I went through that wound up um, that ended with my coming out, you know. I went through a hellish experience, and then, of course, on top of that, I left the church for a few years, you know. And uh, that experience was just more than I was prepared to handle, you know. But the Lord had warned that this was coming, that there was, that there was going to be an onslaught like nothing we'd ever experienced before. And I'm certain that prophecy had to do 
uh, with others in the church as well, not just me, you know. Um, otherwise, the Lord would have just spoken it to me, and he would not have moved upon me to prophesy. Now, we've talked about the fact that prophecy is um, a gift that operates temporally, uh, that people can be anointed of the Holy Ghost in the moment to prophesy, like we've seen in some of our New Testament examples. And then I've talked about the fact that prophecy, uh, uh, that there is an office of prophet, and there are those who operate in the prophetic as an office and not merely as a temporal gift. <coughs> In 1 Corinthians 12, 27 through 31, the Apostle Paul writes, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. See, again, this passage is completely useless to First Baptist Church. This passage doesn't mean squat to them, because according to them, nope, that was then, this is now. But this is what Paul writes to the church at Corinth. He then goes on to say, Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So, Paul is saying, God has set these things in the church. And one of the things that he has said is not prophecy, but he said prophets, secondarily prophets. So that means that there are individuals who occupy a prophetic office, okay? Not merely who prophesy. Then, whoops, let me see. Okay. Then in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Ephesus and says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So again, we read of prophets in the sense of it being an office and not merely being a temporal gift where individuals prophesy. Now, after the resurrection, we're going to go back to what I was talking about earlier Will these things be necessary after the resurrection, after the church has been uh, raptured, after the second coming of the Lord? Will prophecy and the gifts of the Spirit as we know them today, will they be necessary? Well, of course not. When we see face to face, then these things will not be necessary. And the Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians uh, 13 verses 8 through 10. Charity never faileth, love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, meaning end. When he says charity never faileth, he means simply love never ends, it's without end. But whether there be prophecies, they will end, they will fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. 
Now notice the Baptist folk don't claim that with the printing of the Bible, all of a sudden we're a bunch of retarded people running around without any knowledge. And yet that's what the scripture said. Along with prophecy uh, ceasing, along with tongue ceasing, so too will knowledge. Meaning learning. Okay, we're no longer going to have need of learning. We're going to know everything that we need to know. He said in verse 9, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Okay, now, so we know that the day, of course, is coming when the gifts of the Spirit will no longer be necessary. We'll be looking the Lord face to face. We'll be seeing Him face to face. These things will not be necessary. I talk about how important it is to recognize um, the gifts when they're in operation, to be able to appreciate a word of knowledge when a word of knowledge is offered, to appreciate a word of wisdom when a word of wisdom comes to appreciate a prophetic word when it is spoken, whether it be through an individual who has a prophetic office or whether it be through an individual that the Lord is anointed for the moment to prophesy, um, to appreciate tongues with interpretation, so on and so forth. And I talk about how imperative it is for us to be able to identify and appreciate when God is moving and using these gifts to be a blessing, an encouragement, a help uh, to instruct the church. But it's also very important, folks, that we be able to discern and distinguish between an individual when they are operating in the prophetic as an office. You need to be able to appreciate that. You need to be able to see it and appreciate that. That doesn't mean you worship the person. Uh, the Mormons sing hymns about Joseph Smith. Okay, funny, you don't see us in the majority of Christian churches singing hymns in praise and adoration of Ezekiel or Jeremiah or Isaiah or any other prophet. Moses, we don't even sing songs telling the world about how wonderful John the Baptist is, okay? But they glorify their prophet. Their prophet is the center of all their doctrine and all their teaching. In the Christian faith, we don't ever want to fall into that. Don't ever fall into that. However, at the same time, we do need to be able to appreciate when someone has a prophetic gift, okay? Uh, in Matthew 10, 40 through 42, the Lord Jesus Christ said, He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Now, there are a lot of people, well, yeah, they'll, they'll receive somebody who has a prophetic ministry, but they don't do so as a prophet. Yeah, you know, I like Brother so so he's a pretty good guy, you know. Uh, do you recognize him as, as occupying a prophetic office? No. No. Well, then the level of reward, the level of repayment you're going to get for being hospitable or supportive of that individual is based upon how you look at that individual. This, this is where it becomes important to appreciate where somebody's at. Uh, in their ministry. There, there are uh, preachers that I've known over the years, you know, that uh, I have held in the highest esteem. And anybody who knows anything about my ministry knows um, I don't have a bad word to say about one single pastor that I've ever sat under. Uh, I think, I think I've been blessed. I think the Lord allowed me 
to sit under any number of good men. Now, some of them, I disagree at this time in my life. I disagree with much of the doctrine that they uh, believed and taught at the time. But that still doesn't take away from their being good, decent, godly Christian men, okay? And, uh, but those, I've known people who operate in the prophetic. And I guarantee you, when I know somebody operates in the prophetic, then, honey, you better believe when they talk, I listen. I listen. And I'm going to support them. I'm going to be hospitable. I'm going to do everything in my power to help them do what they're trying to do. Because in so doing, the Word of God said, I will receive a prophet's reward. In other words, the Lord's going to reward me accordingly it's just like when you support a man of God when you support a woman of God when you support a missionary when you support somebody that God has called to ministry you're going to receive a reward um, commensurate with the fact that these are people who are obeying the call of God on their life you get it. You are going to receive a greater reward for that than you would if it was just another believer in the church. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? And because you're trying to uh, encourage them, you're trying to support them, you're trying to help provide for them so that they can do the work that God has called them to do. And the Lord literally would rewards us commensurate with the level of um, place in the body that they occupy, okay? And so the Lord said, if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you'll receive a prophet's reward. Now listen. He said, um, and he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. So if you um, are hospitable and supportive of a good person who's, who's living right and doing right because they're a good person and they're living right and doing right, you're going to be rewarded for that. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. So the Lord said, even if someone blesses you just because you're a believer, he said, I'll reward them even if they're not seeing you as anything special per se. But you appreciate this person is the person living their faith. They're doing, uh, you know, they're not just talking the talk, they're walking the walk. And I've known a lot of people in my lifetime who uh, are not Christians. Or maybe they're backslidden out of church. And yet they appreciate somebody who really lives their faith and is really trying their best to, to be a child of God. And they do things for them and they'll, you know, they will bless them uh, simply because they really appreciate that person living their faith, you know, and doing the best they can. And uh, so there is reward, but that reward at the same time does increase as it were based on the role being played within the body of Christ by the individual. So when you support other believers and what have you, you've got a reward coming for that. When you support a minister, ministry, anyone in ministry, there's a reward for that. When you support a prophet in the name of a prophet, you've got to remember, prophet comes in second on the list of offices in the fivefold ministry of the church. God gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So uh, the office of prophet is an extremely important office that plays a very important role. And so, for, and unfortunately, 
the majority, and this is historical, this goes back to the beginning of time, <laughs> the majority of people without fail do not appreciate a prophet as a prophet. Most people will never view a prophet as a prophet. So for those of us few who have enough discernment and enough sense to pay enough attention and say, you know what, it seems pretty obvious to me the Lord uses this person prophetically, you know, consistently uses this person in the prophetic. For those of us who have enough sense to do that and appreciate that person and be supportive of them and hospitable to them, uh, there is a reward that is commensurate with that level. Do you follow what I'm trying to say today? All right, if you look at the Old Testament, there are all kinds of examples in the Old Testament of um, people who were hospitable to a prophet or who blessed a prophet or who gave to the prophet. Uh, in the case of the widow woman with her son, she had just enough meal and just enough oil to make a last meal for her she and her son. And the prophet come along and said, well, I'll tell you what, he said, make me some bread first. Remember the story? And then how the Lord caused her meal to never fail and caused her oil to never fail. You know, um, you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you'll receive a prophet's reward. That is an example of what the Lord's talking about. And then, of course, there's a little lady and her husband who were barren. And uh, when the prophet um, Elijah would come through, they actually built a room under their house so that he would have a place to stay when he was in their area. And uh, what wound up happening to them? The Lord blessed them with a son. He allowed them to have a son even later in life because of there being a blessing to the prophet, you know. And uh, there are many, many examples of this sort of thing. And uh, that just illustrates, you know, how seriously the Lord takes ministry, how seriously, you know, I've tried to explain to people, and, and I'm not saying this in any way uh, to influence how somebody reacts to me or, or looks at me or whatever. That's, that's not what's motivating me. Anybody who knows me knows that I live this. The, 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 this, is, this is, I grew up in this thing. I've always held pastors in high esteem. The Bible said to hold them in high esteem for their very work's sake, okay? In the LGBT community, I'm going to be real frank and honest. I'm going to speak real plain right now. One of the biggest failings in our community is people do not look at ministers and people who are obeying the call of God in their life with any level of respect, any level of appreciation, any level of gratitude. They don't go out of their way for one minute to be supportive or to be a blessing to those people. Um, I can tell you right now that the majority of people, I've said this before, I'll say it again, the majority of people who have been um, a blessing to this ministry over the years, who have been supportive of my work and me and Tommy over the last many years, and me before Tommy, because um, I've been doing this for a decade nearly before I met Tommy, um, have been non-LGBT people without fail. We have one person in the community who has been really supportive of this work for many years. Aside from that, everybody that has given and been supportive has been non-LGBT. And you can use the excuse, uh, well, you know, I was hurt by preachers, and I think most preachers are just hypocrites and blah, 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 blah. You can play that game all you want to play, okay? You can, you can 
you know, think you're fooling God. You're not fooling God, folks. You're not fooling God. Just because I have a bad experience at one restaurant, I don't stop eating at restaurants. No, I find one that I like, and I quit going to the one that I don't like. You've had bad experience with a preacher. Don't sit here and label every preacher a hypocrite. Every preacher falls. Uh, Tommy and I lived, we, this is before we were living together. We, were, we lived apart for eight years. The first eight years of our relationship, we lived separately. We both had apartments in the same apartment complex at one point. We were literally, my apartment was here, there was an apartment between us, and then his apartment was there. And, uh, but I told him when I first met him, you know, I said, I don't believe in, in meeting today and marrying tomorrow. I don't believe in just moving in. And I wouldn't say he was the fastest moving thing on wheels either. So we pretty much were on the same page when that, where that was concerned. And, uh, but we, in this one apartment complex that we were in, the manager of the complex was the guy who had a reputation for being snarky, and he was a member of the community. He was very snarky and very, you know, kind of just crabby, and, you know, and most people didn't care for him a whole lot. He was a good manager at the complex. He kept everything moving smoothly, you know, and he got repairs done and all that, but he just didn't have the greatest personality in the world. And one day, this guy, his name was Joe, he and I were talking, and he said something to me that blew my mind. And he said to me, he said, I know just about every single LGBT affirming preacher in Dallas and the greater Dallas area. I know everyone that's ever been here, everyone that's here now. And he said, and uh, he said, and you're the only one that I can honestly say I fully and totally respect and appreciate. He said, because I've watched you. He said, I watch you. And, I, and that surprised me because you never know who's looking, so to speak, you know. And he said, I've watched you. He says, and you are really sincere and real about uh, your faith and all that. And... Um, that blew my mind because I had no idea this guy was, you know, paying the least bit of attention to me. And, uh, but the point is this, you know, uh, you've got to be able to appreciate when somebody is genuine. And that doesn't mean they're perfect, but when they're sincere and they're genuine. And many people in our community, quite frankly, are cutting themselves off from blessing and cutting themselves off from reward from the Lord. All because they're letting the enemy convince them, oh, there ain't nothing wrong with throwing everybody in the same pool. You know, there ain't nothing wrong with throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You know, and, and just looking negatively and looking uh, suspiciously and looking wickedly at every single person in the community. That's how the enemy is preventing a massive, wonderful spiritual renewal and revival from breaking loose in our community, folks. He's got so many of you convinced that it's okay to look, you know, suspiciously and negatively and critically and nastily at everybody and blah, 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 you know, everybody who's trying to do any kind of a work in our community. And, uh, and I'm here to tell you, whether you like it or not, you're wrong. You're wrong. Uh, I'm almost at the end of our time today. I will tell you that in the last many years, I have had a number of people over the years contact me and tell me, I've had several have told me, um, I've been watching your ministry now for several years, and I never knew they were. They never one time sent me a message. They never one time, you know, notified us. I, I, I never noticed them, you know. Uh, they were probably watching our videos on YouTube and stuff. 
uh, but not live. So we didn't even have any way of knowing, you know, who's watching. We just know there are so many hits, you know. Anyway, and they've told me this. I've been watching your ministry now for several years. And, uh, you know, I went to this affirming Pentecostal church in this community or in that community. Or I traveled this distance to visit this church in this place. And the preacher come on to me and this happened and that happened. And blah, blah, blah. Some real horror stories, which breaks my heart, makes me sick. And these people have said to me, they said, but I've been watching you for a number of years now. And you have been consistent. You, you stand up. You talk about ethics. You talk about morality. You talk about preachers conducting themselves properly. And, uh, you know, said, uh, these others don't do that. They don't even talk about those things, you know, and they certainly don't live it. And they said, but I've watched you for years and years. And uh, I've had people call me and tell me, said, I will never step foot in an affirming Pentecostal church again after what I went through in Indiana or after what I went through in Phoenix or after what I went through in this town or Tampa or whatever. And uh, they said, but, if I ever had the opportunity to visit Dallas, and of course, hopefully now that we're here in Huntsville, uh, they said, I would come and visit your church. And we've had folks that came to our church in Dallas. We had one guy one time, I swear, I have a feeling he was a plant. I have a feeling somebody sent him in there to see if he couldn't get us to do something we ought not to be doing. I don't know if you remember how we'll talk about it later. But anyway, and this person uh, was making some rather obvious moves, you know. And he didn't just do it with me. He tried it with Tommy, too. And uh, anyway, and got nowhere. And all of a sudden, he picked up and left. And we never saw him again when we were at the Super 8. Over, not Super 8, the La Quinta in Garland. And uh, as she would come out to his car that time to listen to some song or something, you know. Anyway, and, uh, but that person was doing things with me, talk, you know, and, and I was like, man, if this fool thinks he's trying to go somewhere with that, he's barking up the wrong tree because that ain't going to happen. And uh, he got nowhere. And next thing you know, he just picked up and left. Never saw him again. And... Uh, because we do believe that ministry is held to a high standard and uh, they're under, well, I'm not, I'm married and any, any intimate activity outside of marriage is adultery where I come from. And uh, I don't believe in adultery, so I'm not interested in committing adultery. And one of the reasons I tell people online do not try to instant message me, please, on Facebook and what have you. Uh, one of the reasons that I say that is 90% of the time when somebody tries to instant message me online, without fail, they're trying to get fresh and trying to get nasty. And I'm not interested. And, and I don't want anybody wasting my time with that foolishness. If you have a sincere issue, if you have an, something you desperately would like to talk to me about and all that, send me a message and expound, you know, tell me I'm wrestling with something and I'd really like your help, you know, blah, blah, blah. Then I can arrange to, to work with you. But I tell people, do not send me an instant message request. Do not send me a hey Oh, I hate that with a passion. Do not send me a hello, not a how are you, what's up, you know. I'm not responding to any of that. The minute I get that, I send a little meme that I've created that says, I'm sorry, I do not instant message, blah, 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 blah. And that's what I respond with. And then if they keep going, and I've had some that if and they've made it obvious where they were trying to go, I send a message back, say, listen, I'm married, I'm not the least bit interested. You can either stop this crap or I'm going to have to block you because I'm not interested in this foolishness. And uh, 
you know, so if if you have a bad attitude about affirming preachers because of some bad experience you've had in the past, um, or what have you, um, I can tell you right now, you'll have a very different experience with us. You will absolutely have a positive experience with us, okay? Um, I don't care how pretty your face is. Pretty faces get old after a while. Look at mine. And, uh, and uh, I'm not interested in messing around and playing around. That, that foolishness is not anything I'm interested in. There have been times in my life, folks, where, you know, I did that kind of crap. Okay, I'm not going to stand here and lie to you and say it's never been anything I didn't do, but that is so far behind me now I can't even see it in the rearview mirror, okay? So I'm not interested in that foolishness, all right? And uh, we do believe in ethics and upholding a standard, especially for ministries. So... If you, if, if you know what's good for you, then you will receive a prophet in the name of a prophet so that you can receive a prophet's reward. Amen. All right, that is all for this evening. I told you I was going to try to end this a little bit earlier. I'm going to try to do this every week from here on out. We'll try to end at 8.30ish instead of 9. And that way, you know, folks can... Um, Get ready for work and do what you have to do. Keep us in prayer, please, for our trip. We leave tomorrow. We'll be coming back probably Saturday or Sunday. I hope to be back in time for church on Sunday. I have every intention of having church on Sunday. But I'm really going to need your prayers because a trip like this is extremely exhausting for me. And... Um, I'm really going to need the Lord to help me to be able to do church on Sunday after driving 12 or 14 hours, however long it takes to get up here from Dallas, okay? And um, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we close our time together tonight. Master, once again, Lord, we thank you, we love you, we appreciate you. We are so grateful for the Word of God. We are so grateful for the wisdom, the instruction, the direction that you give us. Lord, you allow us to walk in blessing and in divine favor if only we'll approach spiritual, spiritual things with a spiritual mind. I pray, Lord, that those things which we've discussed today will somehow be a blessing and encouragement and a help to those who have listened and participated in this Bible study. Allow us, Lord, to understand that which we've heard. If we still have questions, if we still have thoughts, then by your Spirit answer those questions and provide the answers that we seek. Master, in the name of Jesus, we ask God that you would go with us from this place. Help us to meditate upon your word for those, Lord, who have not yet received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Lord, you're able to fill with the Holy Ghost right now where they sit. You're able, God, to pour out the gift of the Holy Ghost right now in their home, in their uh, dormitory, in their car, wherever they may be. You're able, Lord, right this moment to anoint and touch and fill with the Holy Ghost and power for your glory. And Master, in the name of Jesus, keep us safe, Lord. Keep us in your care uh, as we make this trip to Dallas and help us to get back safely and securely to get everything done we need to do. And Lord, uh, help us to be ready to worship you and to prepare Present the word of God to your people on Sunday. Master, we love you. We thank you. You're a wonderful God and you're forever blessing us and we appreciate those blessings. We ask all this today in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. All right, folks, I hope we'll see you Sunday, God willing, at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. And then again next uh, Wednesday night at uh, 
7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer.